Hi, I'm Diana Belker, pastor of First Congregational United Church of Christ in Santa Rosa, and this is Sermons to Go. Today, we're looking at Palm Sunday. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii? and the money given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She brought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Our dog, Fozzie, is 11 pounds of sweetness. She kind of has two modes though. One is sweetness and love and the other is fear and trembling. And when she's afraid, her instincts kick in and well, let's just say she's probably not going to last very long on her own or in the wild. Her instinct is when she's afraid is to either make herself really small and hope that whatever's the aggressor will leave her alone or she'll try to run. And sadly for her, she's not especially good at knowing where to run to. She's not figured out that she should probably run to her humans and we will protect her. Instead, she has this fight or, excuse me, flee or freeze response, which tends to leave her a little bit more vulnerable and a little less protected, which adds, as you can imagine, to the fear. And this fear keeps turning in on herself. And I keep trying to talk with her and to encourage her to stand up to her fear, to come to me when she's afraid. And we've had some long talks. So far, they have not been especially successful. But fear is a hard thing to stand up to. And we can hear a lot of fear. I hope you heard it in our scriptures this morning. In most of these cases, I think we heard the kind of fear that turns outward, more or less the fight response. Some of these stories and these characters, I hope, are familiar to you, and others might seem new. Some of it felt new to me because this scripture is not typically read in our three-year cycle of scriptures that most Protestant churches follow. And if you're wondering why is that, well, I don't know specifically, I did not consult a history book, but if I were to make a wager, I'd say it's because of fear. These stories as they're told to us from John 
speak directly to the Jewish leaders plotting to kill Jesus. And Christians have been merciless to the Jewish people, and we've sought to take revenge for Jesus' death for 2,000 years. So my hunch is that when they were putting together the cycle of texts we were to hear each three years, they chose different versions that are a little bit less obvious and less fearful or less angry towards those Jewish leaders. I could be wrong, but that's a hunch. My hunch is that we were trying to shift our focus away from fear and away from turning that fear against others. Because not everyone is as sweet and vulnerable as Fozzie. And so what we heard this morning is this interesting story connecting the stories and the tissue between those, the story of death and resurrection of fear and of faith. Before this, before this begins, we hear that Jesus was raised from the dead and the word is spreading. Then Jesus, as our scripture starts, goes to Lazarus' home and is anointed, as Jesus says, for his own burial. Judah is present and disgusted, and the narrator describes him as a thief and a deceiver. And we begin to really hear the story of the crowd, a crowd that is swelling beyond the chief priest's ability to control it. And those priests are afraid. I wonder what scares them the most. You know, John says in verse 10 and 11, the chief priests plan to put Lazarus to death as well since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Were these priests afraid of losing followers or losing the followers money to another cause? Were they afraid that Jesus was a master manipulator that was leading their sheep astray? Or were they simply afraid of someone who seemed to be able to control life and death? Honestly, any one of these is a good reason for them to fear. The reading ends in chapter 19 in that way that I don't know if, if you noticed it, but I kind of wanted it to continue. It just, it just stopped. It says, the Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. These priests are completely out of control. These powerful leaders are challenged theologically, socially, religiously, politically, they are afraid of what might come next. And you know, feeling that feeling is fine. We all feel fear from time to time, it's natural. And so we also know that fear can lead us towards making poor decisions, sometimes harming ourselves and others in the process. Fear left unchecked can drive people towards violence. We know that fear does not have to result in violence, but we also know that it has, and it does, and sadly, it will again. Our headlines are filled with people taking out their fear on others, taking lives, terrorizing, spreading fear and hate. I don't need to point it out too directly because I know we can all feel it when we hear about things like the Capitol riot or one of the many mass shootings. I was up to three, maybe four, of the past two weeks. And when we're trying to take all of this in, it can feel so discouraging. And we can begin to feel fearful ourselves. Which is why I want us to look again at this scripture for signs of God's spirit at work. For while I can hear and feel the fear in this text, I also hear and feel courage Courage comes from the Latin word cor, which means heart. So it means something like take heart. Which reminds me of this quote from Franklin Roosevelt, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. Something might be more important, more motivating <clears throat> than giving in to our fear. And I suspect love of self, love of others, love of country, love of the earth, something like that. A deep love, taking heart, 
helps us lean in and overcome a fear that would turn us inward or outward. I wonder if you can name with me the many people within this ancient story taking heart and demonstrating courage. I've come up with a few. Let's start with Mary, who walks into a room of men, opens a jar, washes Jesus' feet, and breaks all kinds of customs and norms. The guests are appalled. And then Jesus suggests, no, Mary is brave and loving and looking after his well-being even after his death. Lazarus is also a courageous figure. His very presence is a mark of courage and love because he's an oddity, a person of note, not because of anything he did, but because he lives again. His presence is causing so much commotion that he too is now with someone with a target on his back. And yet he doesn't go into hiding he doesn't try to shift the story that people are telling about him. Rather, he invites Jesus to dinner, and his life is now also threatened a second time. The people who gather palms along the road, I think, are acting in love rather than fear. They are brave and courageous for the ways they are actively engaged in a parade that parrots and mocks the Roman Empire. That's dangerous work. And of course, there's Jesus, whose love leads him towards those who are in pain, those who are being harmed, and towards speaking truth that unsettles those in power. And since it's Jesus, I think I want to suggest, well, it should be obvious that love is probably motivating Jesus to conquer his fears. But I also just want us to take a moment and say, I think Jesus, because he's human, probably feels the fear too. But Jesus does not let his fear motivate him. He does not flee. He does not run or hide. He keeps loving and healing and inviting us to follow him. And I wonder if I've left anyone out. There are so many characters in this text and a dizzying array of actions and reactions and overreactions that will continue as Jesus stays in Jerusalem until he is taken outside the walls and crucified which brings us the Holy Week, a week of precious, difficult stories all back to back. A difficult week when we in the Christian tradition dare to have courage and look at some topics that tend to make us all fear and grieve. Last Supper, betrayal, injustice, death penalty. Each one of these is an emotional doozy and there's no shame in feeling fear when we consider these topics. And I hope we will all take heart and hold on tight to an aspect of love that will see us through. So this week, I invite you to memorialize your meal on Thursday. In case you did not know or have forgotten, Thursday is called Monday Thursday, and it's a celebration of the Last Supper. It's where our sacrament of communion comes from. Monday means commandments. And you may recall that Jesus tells us to take and eat. This is my body given for you. Each time you share this meal, do so in remembrance of me. And so on Thursday, I hope you will remember. In your Linton care package, you received a Welcome to Lent publication that includes an at-home worship service called a liturgy. In fact, I hope you still have it. It looks something like this. And towards the back of that, it has a bit of background on the holiday, a lentil soup recipe from, I believe, Martha Stefanoni, and two pages of prayers and scriptures and conversation starters. So I invite you to open that up, take your time, maybe use the good plates or maybe get takeout. But remember that whatever meal you choose, the morning meal, afternoon, whatever it is, take some time and set it aside to remember this story. 
on Friday, we call it Good Friday, and we'll have a worship service together here on Zoom. And it, I think, is going to be a pretty special service. We're going to remember the Stations of the Cross as told through the lens of both scripture and some Black Lives Matter resources. And the hope here is that we will begin to memorialize Christ's death and bring in our current struggles. So bring a piece of paper and a pencil to that one, and there will be some interactive pieces along with some more choral pieces from our choir and some beautiful music. And because we know that there is another Sunday on the other side of this fear, on the other side, we know that the despair and fear we may feel this week will not be the final word or the final feeling. And so I invite you brothers and sisters in faith to join the crowd, witness the injustice, feel your feelings, but do not let fear overtake you. For we follow Christ who again and again leads us and shows us how to draw upon love, that we might live with courage to love and serve in Christ's name. So may it be. Amen. <laughs>